Good evening, everyone. I'm Louise Bradshaw. I'm the Director of Education here at the St. Louis Zoo, and it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the zoo tonight to hear a wonderful lecture from my dear friend, Jean Ponzi, on Sustainability 101. We're particularly interested and in, in, in appreciative of Jean's enthusiasm and interest for sustainability and in ma for many reasons here at the St. Louis Zoo. First of all, she's been a mentor to us, as she has to many people and organizations in the St. Louis community as we all move forward together to work on sustainability issues, greening our own practices, being able to talk about sustainability opportunities with our guests. She's also um, one of the founders of Earth Day here in St. Louis, um, which will be uh, coming up. Who knows when Earth Day is? It's the 22nd, and we're celebrating it here in St. Louis on the 27th, right here in Forest Park. And we'll also have activities here at the St. Louis Zoo as well. So Jean is, um, is a wealth of all knowledge and wisdom about sustainability. I think she, uh, you, you can contact her with all sorts of sustainability questions and connections for sustainability. Um, and uh, one of the things, too, I wanted to, to mention at the zoo, we're particularly excited about some of our new initiatives that are coming along. We, uh, we are greening this building. As you, those of you who are coming in have seen, we've got a new flooring here that's Marmoleum, which is a recycled product. We're doing a lot with our own operations. And in 2015, we're opening a new exhibit, a new habitat for our polar bears that's going to be a, a, have a really strong message about conservation and climate change and how we can all come together for polar bears. So it's really about this whole community coming together, working together for sustainability. And, and we wouldn't be here without mentors like Jean. So without further ado, Jean Ponzi. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I, I realize I'm up against some stiff competition talking about monarch butterflies over at the garden. And my whole team, when we found out that talk was the same night as this, we all thought it was David Bauer. And I got so excited because I thought, oh my gosh, I could go see David Bauer. And then I realized he was dead. Small point, no, it's Lincoln Brower. So um, I am very honored to be here at the invitation of the St. Louis Academy of Science and the um, St. Louis Zoo. The zoo has really been the monster of accomplishment of all of our cultural institutions for many years, long before we really got our act together and stitched our little pockets of green into a functional green suit at the Missouri Botanical Garden where I work. The zoo, which is like a little city, they've got transportation, they've got food service, they've got um, a zillion kinds of guest services. They do all of their landscaping, all of their horticulture. They manage all of those operations here, and they were doing that in a green way, way before it was popular. So it's a, a big shout out to what the zoo does and how the zoo has helped lead the way into the kind of culture that I'm able to showcase to you in my talk tonight, Sustainability 101. That's kind of the generic title of a lot of talks that I give, but this one, your efforts matter. This one is, my goal here is to show you what is happening in the St. Louis region and to give you examples of what human beings like ourselves are figuring out about how to live within the limits of the functioning systems of our planet, which has not been our strong point for much of the time we've been the dominant species here on the Earth. So we're trying to get with the program. We're working on it. As Louise said, I've been working in this subject matter for a long time. My background is in media communications. That's my professional field. I've been dealing with green now for 25 years. And most of that time, it has been very hippy-dippy, marginalized, hard to find, weirdo, left-wing, fluffy. And now it is mainstream and functional. And a big hunk of what I'm going to show you tonight has to do with the business sector in St. Louis, which is where I work primarily in my job as the green resources manager at the garden. And 
Five, four, four years ago when I started working with businesses, if anybody had told me that I was going to see the level of evolution of sustainability literacy put into practice, integrating into values in the business sector that is happening now, I would have spit in their eye, frankly. But I am so proud and so wowed of, with what's happening. And I think part of the issue, as with many other things in St. Louis, is we really don't see it as much as we need to. And then it's sort of un, an unsung story. So as a troubadour of green, um, of green accomplishment, green growth in St. Louis, that's a big part of the purpose of this talk here tonight. Every, one of the things I love about this field, when I discovered environmental subject matter as a professional focus, which was not original to me in any way, shape, or form, what I loved about it was it relates to everything, so it's never boring, for one thing. You never have to get into one little niche. There's always something new to learn, and I find that a really stimulating thing. There also are some pretty hefty challenges out there, but if you subscribe to the viewpoint, which I do, that you put your energy and put your focus where you want it to do the most good and accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, it's not a stupid, dippy thing to do. It really is a way to focus learning and achievement and connections and relationship. And you'll see those kinds of focuses and those kinds of connections and relationships all around the natural world, which we need to adopt. We need to put aside some of our hubris and connect with the natural world as a teacher. Um, I am living proof that any human, anywhere, anytime, can flip on the green light in mind and heart. I am a true daughter of the 1950s. I grew up before we had remote controls. You had to get up to change the channel and walk across the room. And so you'd get some exercise. That was a good thing for human health. It was also the era, the 50s, right after World War II, right after planned obsolescence came in, right after plastics that were developed into the war effort started to become the really popular handy thing. And now we realize we're filling our endocrine systems and all that kind of stuff with phthalate, phthalates and you know I don't even want to go into that that's more than I can handle this late in the day uh, but in 1970 when the first Earth Day took place I was in high school in Wisconsin which is where it originated and I have absolutely no memory of that likewise I moved to st. Louis in 1974 kind of a, you know, one thing led to another. That's been my MO in life. And I was here when citizens were stopping the Merrimack Dam. They were keeping one of our main, main watersheds, one of our main riverways free flowing and live as a river. Many of those people are my friends now, but I had no knowledge of that. I would see those little stop, I mean, those Merrimack Dam stickers underneath the word stop on stop signs and go to Werenberg theaters and have no knowledge about that. It totally sort of dawned on me, dropped in my lap when I worked at the Botanical Garden the first time in the 1980s. So anywhere, anybody, anytime can get hip to green, and that has become my purpose in life, to switch on the green lights in the minds and the hearts of my fellow humans, and to ask good questions, because we don't always come up with the right idea at the start of things. It's good to keep asking and keep evaluating. And a lot of what Sustainability 101 is about now is, is developing, the question, developing the ability to ask questions, applying some core principles of sustainability. And also to do that with some humility and some grace and realize that we do not know all the answers. We are not thinking in systems and functioning in a systemic way in our decision-making capabilities, yet as a species overall, but the natural world is, and that's something that we have to learn from. We tend to do things in a linear manner. You get something, use it for a while, and <clears throat> throw it away. Where is a way, really? That is a linear thinking system. And there's a lot of things that you know a two-point decision-making matrix is good for. Yes, good and evil, knowing the difference between them. Male and female, that's good for keeping species going. Plus, it can be a lot of fun. There are a lot of ways in which you know zeros and ones have given us our entire artificial intelligence system based on that binary interaction of those two digits. But when you are making decisions and functioning in the real world, in the biological 
world, a two-point decision-making matrix of good, bad, profit and loss, yes, no, done, not done, that is simply not sufficient. So we need to learn to ask better questions. Key principles, core principles for life on Earth. We live on a biological planet. Biology is not about cutting up earthworms and frogs and stuff like that. It's about observing relationships. It's about observing patterns. It's about looking at things that you might go eek at first and then have the courage or find somebody like, you know, a docent at the zoo that's willing to introduce you to that species that gives you the creeps at, at first. We need to be aware of biology and in our increasingly technological society, where everything is pushing us away from that. This is no substitute for this. And you get to have them both. And that's a really important phenomenon to be aware of. A cool thing, you know, we live in, we live in an integrated, functioning, systemic whole. We can take a cue from the organism that we live in. So all of the systems in a human body, so holler out the names of some of those systems in a human body. Louder. Digestive, reproductive, mm -hmm. endocrine, the circulatory system, the musculoskeletal system, all of those systems, they all, each one of them does their unique job, but they must work together for an integrated whole. And the same is true of any relationship in ecology. Whether you're looking at a community that involves human beings living in their homes, and perhaps we biodiversify our little patch of God's green earth so it becomes home to other species too, not just us and the dog and the grass. Uh, the interrelationship between those things and how does it function, how does it work, in the same way that we figure out how to work in relationship with, you know, you fall in love with someone and you got to figure that out. There's a lot of ins and outs. We need to kind of fall in love with the systems and the communities of the earth that we live on and start to understand what it means to think about and evaluate things in a systemic way. We have a phenomenal model in everything in the natural world, starting with the plant world. And I work for the Missouri Botanical Garden partly because um, I love plants, and, I, and also anything bigger than plants and bugs, when they die, their bodies gross me out. So I could never work at the zoo. That's more than I could handle. But um, sorry, it's just you know my personal preference. Now, it's a, it's a limitation that I have. And I'm not even mentioning elephants, Louise, not tonight. Plants, we have. We, we get all of our food from plants. We get fiber, we get fuels, we get medicines, we get shelter, we get all of that from the plant world. And it's tough working for the botanical garden and having to pipe up on behalf of plants. I mean, once in a while you get something like the orchid show or the corpse plant and everybody goes, oh wow, isn't that wonderful? But mostly they just sort of stand there and produce oxygen and take away our waste and yet we are in an intimate interrelationship with them. Plants can produce food from sunlight. This is as good as we've done so far. And we haven't even managed to get the economics of this you know, solar energy business down so that we can maximize that. Looking at the plant world, everybody do this with me. Oops, this goes to my, one of my next slides. There we go. What's next? Thank you. What's next? And then I hyperventilate and fall off the stage. What are we inhaling? What are we inhaling? Oxygen. And what living things is oxygen a waste product from? And what are we exhaling that is a waste product from our respiratory system? And what living things need that waste product in order to survive? Yes, so those kinds of synergies are happening all over the natural world. And in a situation like carbon, we have this overload of carbon in our environment, in our atmosphere. It, the discipline of permaculture, which is like permanent culture, it's, it's a transformation of the way we look at food production and human beings and land use and plants, says that the solution is in the problem. So with the overload of carbon in the atmosphere, what can we do with that carbon? What can we do with a waste product 
that becomes feedstock for someone else's productivity. In the natural world, this is a huge core principle. Every single waste product from last year's nest to yesterday's lunch to dead bodies to poop becomes food or habitat for some other living thing. And we are the only species that, this was so sad, I had a little freebie um, uh, tape measure. <laughs> <laughs> that I picked up at an Earth Day festival and I took it out of my purse and it totally fell apart. So what am I going to do with this stuff now? You know, and when we design products, when we design things, we need to think zero waste when we do that design. I'm going to digress from the PowerPoint here for just a minute and show you two things. I need two volunteers, please, to come down to the stage. Just come right down here. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is two examples of packaging. Here's one, packaging. And here is another one. Would you take a look at those things there, ladies, please? What's your name? Erin. Erin and? Kelly. Kelly, okay. So step, come on up on the stage. Come up the stage for a second. Erin, what, first of all, what is the material that the stuff, your package you're holding is made of? Okay, it's actually, it's not cardboard. Does it remind you of anything else? Egg cartons. Egg cartons. It's actually a molded paper product. And what do you think was shipped in that package? There, now you can hold it up and people can really see it. Electronics. Bingo. Specifically, any idea? Small, fits in. Or a hard drive, actually, that's a package for a hard drive, which is probably kind of a dinosaur in the IT world, or almost now. Anyway, and so paper that has been paper before a number of times can be molded into a shape to specifically hold, this is where the, this is where the, and that little slit where the hard drive goes, and everything else holds the hard drive still and stable in the package that can have all the advertising and the logos and all that on it and get shipped in that thing. That's a pretty good design to ship a very high-tech, complicated item. What do you think, Kelly, what material is that, would you say? It is indeed. It is polystyrene, which yes. is styrofoam is the brand name for that kind of plastic resin. And what do you think was shipped in that item? I call that a fruit sweater. Oh, yeah. And it contained an Asian like pear, yes. which there are many kinds of pears that can survive shipping, but apparently Asian pears need to be encased in their own little darling hand-knit stretchy fruit sweaters <laughs> in order to get from wherever they're grown in Asia to you and still be tolerable and only cost like, you know, 69 cents a pound. Well, they're actually, they are a little on the fla fragile side in the world of pears. You could make a fruit sweater out of something that could be recycled in the same way that you could make a shipping container for a hard drive out of polystyrene, the same kind of material that can expand and is very lightweight and very cheap to ship and is completely unrecyclable in most places and it's made from fossil fuels and don't get me started on all that duda. So thank you very much. Okay. That was excellent. Let's hear it for Aaron and Kelly. And the fruit sweater. Um, so when you s design, there's a lot of design needs having to do with sustainability. What is the thing going to be used for? Are there any waste products used in producing it? Could those waste products become feedstock for anyone else and anyone else's process? Here's another example of that kind of thinking in action. Would you please, oh, I'm a very terrible shot, sorry. But on the other hand, I'm not liable for anyone's industry, I injury. Would you, um, sir, what's your name? Russ. Russ, would you, do you know what that is, what that product is? Exactly. It's tubular, it's designed to go around a duct or a pipe. And the stuff that is the insulating material in it, can you tell what it is? What, what, what it was in its previous life? kind of tufts, kind of like a little padding. You are not wearing it, but you are wearing it. 
Would you take a look at this and see if you can tell the lady in the yellow jacket? Can you tell what this was before it was insulation? Pardon? Fabric. Denim. Specifically, fabric denim. So if you're, if you want, do you want, thank you, Russ, would you want to throw that back to me? Oh, that was so good. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so this is an example of post-industrial recycling. This is manufacturers of denim clothing. They weave the fabric in long swaths, right, long bolts, and then you cut out all the weird little odd pieces and you sew them together and you have a lot of scraps. What are you going to do with those scraps, with those waste products? You're either going to pay to send them to a landfill to throw them away, where is away, or you're going to find somebody who could be an end user of your waste product and you're going to sell that to them as a feedstock. You're going to keep that stuff in use in cycles and minimize waste improve your profitability, and your thinking in systems before you design the item. That's one of the big things we have to do, is we have to change our thinking before we go into the process. And with composting, I just did a radio interview today with St. Louis Composting that is going to air next week, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday on May 5th, about compost, which it dawned on me as I was talking about it, there's hardly any sort of silver bullet things in the world of green, but sunlight, compost, and water, those are as close as I think we come to something that is good for almost anything. Uh, and why do we need to do that? Well, because we waste enormous amounts of Organic material, of course, the things that come off of our leaves and our yards that can be composted, but also food waste now. Either you don't sell or serve as much in the first place, or you don't buy as much in the first place because you reduce first, then you reuse, then you recycle, or you donate the still usable foodstuffs to a food pantry that can use it, or you send the scraps to be composted. And this process, this is a really beautiful crystalline example of how you get just a few ingredients. Carbon, again, there's that problem. There's what we have too much of, carbon in the atmosphere. So how many processes can we engage carbon to put it into productive use and get it out of the atmosphere? And I'm not going to be talking tonight about that from a scientific standpoint, because for one thing, that exceeds my talking knowledge base. But the, this is a very, very fundamental example, what we mimic when we, we cycle our human-made products. Carbon, life stuff, organic stuff that has no long, is no longer living. It's called brown matter because often it is brown. Uh, the water is out of it. Nitrogen contains a lot of water. You need three parts carbon, one part nitrogen, maybe a little bit more H2O, some oxygen to give it uh, uh, the, the power to heat up and then decomposers to do the work and break it all down and you have a synergistic relationship that over time takes waste and transforms it into erosion control, water conservation, soil health building, um, uh, rain garden making ingredients, and it smells good. So I already said this, this is really critical. Everything in the natural world works in cycles and we gotta get out of our linear ways of thinking and start thinking in cyclic systemic patterns. And when you transform from this, this two point decision making matrix to this, what's called the triple bottom line in business, it's like going from a world in which everything is two dimensional, all the art is two dimensional and it's all really flat and all of a sudden you have sculpture. And it's not that the two-dimensional is bad or limited, it's that it's not the only thing and it's not sufficient. It's not enough. We need to have um, more dimensions that we're working in. And this one little jump from here to here, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, is a very, very quantum leap. Uh-oh, I just knocked my batteries out. There we go. Okay. Then, also, we got to stop thinking in silver bullet fashions. Water, yes, it's the universal solvent. Sunlight can produce food. It can produce energy. It warms us up. It's a, it's a healing force. It puts vitamin D in our bodies. We need that to be healthy. But we're not only going to power ourselves on solar panels. 
as we're transitioning away from fossil fuels and our dependence on fossil fuels, we got to put renewables wherever where we can put them. And we also have to eliminate all of the waste from our energy using systems. And I think this is probably photoshopped. But what if we had wind turbines in places where there was artificial wind being manufactured by you know, semi-trucks and cars running down the highway? What if we covered all of our parking garages with solar panels and the cars parked in those garages could, ch could charge while they're in the garages and then maybe even feed back some extra energy into the grid? Where can we put those cyclic, systemic, technologies so that they may, uh, not enable us to work in harmony and live in harmony with the natural world we work in. Food, I can't say enough good stuff about food as a cornerstone of Sustainability 101. When food became an environmental focus, an environmental issue, that was like the greatest thing since sliced bread for a ge green geek like me because frankly people do not get happy about nukes and dead whales. And you can talk about that kind of stuff as long as you want, but it's, it's hard to engage people on a heart level where we need to engage in order to change our thinking and our behaviors. But food has to do with your relationships and your holidays and what feels good and you know what's joyful and what's loving. And so all of the things having to do with food, transportation, obesity, levels of, uh, you know, what is it that we're eating economically? How are we dealing with commodity crops versus crops that, that are not so resource intensive in our agricultural system? All of that ties into food and it ties in in a way that can engage people joyfully. So the proliferation of things like farmers markets and local, uh, you know, community gardens, of course, backyard gardens, all of that is a huge jump up in sustainability taking place in our communities. One of my goals for this you know, next section of my life, I would love to be the sustainability advisor on a soap opera that would deal with these kinds of subjects and that would dramatize them. And the name of the soap opera is Love of Limits. Because we, are, you know, we, get, we get limits and the benefit of limits drummed out of us so much. We're supposed to want more, more, more. More is better. The gross natural product. How much can you earn? How much can you have? How much can you put out? Nothing in the natural world works on more, more, more. You got more, you got less. You got the maximum, you got no thing. And it goes around like that in cycles. And every woman, every female human being who has experienced the cycle of being filled and then being empty. And something, sometimes something's produced out of that and sometimes it's not. It happens in biology. And it is an example that we need to learn from. And maybe it's no accident that we've had about 4,000 years of patriarchal culture, too, that tells us things like women's bodies are unclean. So we don't pay attention to the value of what we're living in, what we are embodying in as we develop our values. And then we have places like suburbs that tell you you can't have clotheslines. If I couldn't have my clothesline, I would boycott City Hall. My compost pile and my clothesline, I, I am dyed in the wool, advocate of them. And not everything works on a clothesline. Underwear turns to cardboard on a clothesline. But everything else, all the heavy stuff, the jeans and the sweaters and the towels and all that kind of stuff, you don't have to run 45 minutes of gas and electricity or whatever, you just put it out there in the sun. And then if you want to fluff it up and get it all nice and toasty, five minutes in the dryer, voila. Go to Italy, their underwear is all over the balconies, all over the streets. They don't even have dryers in Italy. And are they suffering? No, not necessarily. Things like keeping backyard chickens, having rain barrels, having rain gardens, being able to harvest water, especially in drought when we really need it and use that right on site. Urban farming that gives people skills that will enable them to have a livelihood and produce food close to home so we don't have to transport it halfway across the planet just to have an almond. That kind of stuff, we need more of those innovations and we need to work those things into our urban planning and our economic development and our community values and it is happening in St. Louis. We do all reap the fruits of whoever is above us and whatever they're flushing down to us and down below us, anybody 
downstream from us is dealing with whatever our flotsam and our waste product is. So again, cycles. It goes around, comes around. It pays to keep everybody's little habitat functional and tidy. And then we have drought, we have mudslides, we have wildfires, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes, we have tsunamis, we have all that kind of stuff. And we are, ladies and gentlemen, we are the last country in the industrialized world that is still having people talk nightly on television about whether or not climate change is happening. <sighs> Sometimes I get a little fried about this stuff, but not, I try not to. Aw, oh, wouldn't that be just too bad? A lot of wasted effort. Okay, so some of the issues at hand. I'm going to focus on three here tonight. I am not going to focus on energy, although that could be another whole talk. And it's huge. Energy has always opened the door when you talk to people about sustainability because when you turn off the lights or you unplug the thing or you put your chargers into a strip and you switch off the strip and pull the plug on phantom power, you're saving money on your utility bill. Right away, there's something in your wallet that's going to talk to you about the value of going green. This, by the way, this is, where do you think this guy is? He's on top of the arch, and he's changing the light bulb on the top of the arch to an LED. That's our federal tax dollars at work. And you, you know, you can't always ride a bike to everything. You can't always power everything with wind and sun. But where can we do those things? How can we have more micro solutions, locally appropriate solutions? It's and we should always put LEDs on the tops of our national monuments. I think that should become a federal law. Water is a huge issue. We have had wars in our recent history over oil. When we get to the point where water shortages become a political issue, we must have water to live. So in the St. Louis area, we're very fortunate to have organizations that get people out onto water and help us form relationships with the incredible water resources that we have here. Missouri River Relief is doing a big cleanup on Saturday the 26th of, of April uh, up at the confluence. They have cleaned up, I think, I just, I just typed this up today because I'm going to have them on a um, show next week at KDHX. Thousands of miles of river from the western border of, Mississippi, of Missouri to the eastern border of, I'm sorry, all the way out to Kansas. This group puts people out on the big rivers in boats safely to get crap out of the river and also help us form a relationship with the watershed that we are a part of that otherwise we wouldn't have that relationship and so why would we care? We live at the confluence of the fourth largest watershed on the planet Earth. That is a distinction for us. And yet water has been a topic that, in my experience, is one of the least talked about because we don't have a problem with it. Let's think about it. Let's deal with it. Let's plan for it. Let's engage with it before we have to have a problem and then lead by example. Climate change, I'm not going to talk about this much either because that's another whole nine yards. But an organ I mean, we're hearing about it everywhere. And an organization like 350.org, which started with one professor who was originally a journalist, Bill McKibben, at Middlebury College in Vermont, and seven students, students in the background there from Flow Valley, that group wanted to have a demonstration back in, what year was that, Louise? Rachel Crandall was, was right before Rachel Crandall died. 2006, seven? They wanted to have an international demonstration where people would hold up the number 350, all as many, in many places as they could think of, because 350 parts per million is the number, is the, the concentration of carbon that the atmosphere can hold and function as an atmosphere around our planet. One professor and seven students 
tens of thousands of these demonstrations all over the planet on that 350 day. And so that 350 number has become a rallying cry. It's something that you can put your mind around, whereas millions and billions and trillions don't really get people's imagination. And this guy was the president of the country, the Maldives, which is an island nation. They were holding a cabinet meeting underwater in scuba gear as a demonstration of what will happen to the Maldives as climate change proceeds and ocean levels rise. They will have all of their cabinet meetings and all of their trips to the grocery store and all of their marriages and births and deaths and birthday parties underwater. Okay, so I am gonna talk a little bit about biodiversity, although I'll be back in October and do a whole talk about biodiversity. This is the big dance. This is all nine yards. This is the whole enchilada. This is all life on Earth. This is microbial life. It's life in the soil. It's everything in the oceans. It's everything in the atmosphere. It's everything that swims and crawls and flies and has interaction and all of the systems that support it. And we are a part of that circle of life, only we think we're not. So we need to learn about it and we need to understand when we're planning our backyard gardening, for example, oops, that the native plants that we pick, we should pick the ones that are pretty if we like pretty plants, but which ones support the most insect larval development, which in turn allows the birds that you feed with seed in the winter to reproduce and raise their young because baby birds don't eat seed, they eat larva and they need protein. And if you want birds, you need to have a relationship between plants and bugs and birds and you. And that's a love story. And that is a way of thinking about our environment that we really have gotten very, very divorced from. In our region, we have such a wealth of biodiversity engaged organizations and in two weeks, Missouri Botanical Garden is hosting a Midwest Regional Urban Biodiversity Conference and one of our keynote speakers, Stephen Kellert, who wrote a book about biophilic design, that's one of the upcoming talks on the Academy of Science speaker series groups from all around the Midwest talking about how are we dealing with biodiversity in our communities? How do we make this become a household word and something that people can and will care about? It's everywhere. It's what we wear. It's what we live in. It's what we eat. It's what makes the things we eat. It's our recreation. It's, it's all of the food and fuel and fibers and provisioning. That is biodiversity, is supporting ecosystem services supporting our lives. So we need to change, it's, we think about our region this way, and that's good. We've defined these regions, these cities, these counties, these boundaries, these are geopolitical human functional boundaries. We've got those down, we figured that out. We also need to be able to look at our region like this and know what we're seeing and appreciate that. And it takes some learning. It takes a little bit more literacy. It takes a little bit more of a stretch. So there is an initiative in St. Louis. It's called Biodiverse City St. Louis. There's the website, biodiversitystl.org. The Missouri Botanical Garden sort of appointed ourselves the hub of that wheel. We got to jump on the zoo, but hey, we are plants. We are plants. We're the producers. You are the consumers. And, all, and many organizations are in this, to leverage the resources and better promote the resources of the wealth of organizations that we have dealing with biodiversity. It was 2007, was it, or was it nine, where we passed the point for the first time in human history where more people live in urban areas than not. The first time in human history so we're much more concentrated. In many ways, that's good because we can make use of infrastructure in a more efficient way. But in many ways, it's also creating much more of a demand from our concentrated urban environments that decimate the biodiverse parts where we're not living. And we're not really thinking about making our urban environments biodiverse. We're thinking we have to go out to a national park or you know, be in a, um, a Hummer commercial or something in order to experience biodiversity. Biodiversity is really critical because ecosystem services, that's a buzzword in my profession, it 
is everything that the planet provides for us. It's energy, it's dealing with waste, it's food production, it's all of the raw materials, it's uh, uh, education, it's aesthetic kind of stuff, it has to do with um, political stability, it has to do in many, you know, where you go in different parts of the world and it looks different and it feels different, it has to do with cultural richness as opposed to having everything be homogenous and impoverished. And it has to do with a lot of things that are very close to home. Pollinators are a really good starting point to talk about biodiversity. This, is, this was a beautiful thing, that a really brilliant thing that a Whole Foods in uh, New England did. They took a picture of your typical Whole Foods produce section. Now, you know, I kind of call it whole paycheck. I can't exactly afford to shop there, but I do like the samples. So you go around this beautiful, ge you know, geometric, beautifully maintained, totally perfect area, and you see all this wealth of produce. This is what that same produce section would look like without honeybees. Just honeybees. And they're not even native to this continent. They were brought over by European settlers. We've got all the native pollinators that include all kinds of species of bees. Ed Spivak, one of the invertebrate specialists here at the zoo, is one of the major experts on pollinators. We have huge resources here. Uh, uh, solitary bees, native bees, as well as our domesticated honeybees, beetles, some kinds of birds, uh, butterflies, moths, some mammals, bats are pollinators. One species of fly, the midge fly, pollinates all chocolate. Need I say more? We need to be aware of these relationships and we need to appreciate them and cultivate them. And like hobby beekeepers are doing this, they're taking up the craft of beekeeping in a backyard way in order to support a species that we have come to depend on for almonds and fruits, all the kinds of things that are missing from that Whole Foods produce section because of pesticides and habitat loss and colony collapse disorder and mites and all kinds of other weird stuff. A biodiversity can look like, you know, beautiful environments like the Missouri Botanical Garden. It can look like beautiful wildernesses, prairie areas. It can look like all of those things. It also can look like parts of a parking lot and little swales along the sidewalk and urban gardening areas that are integrated within our landscape. It can look like places in public and private lands. And it looks like us, because we are part of biodiversity too. It isn't just the bugs and the bees and the birds and all that kind of stuff, it's us. And we need to see ourselves in that picture and function in those relationships. All over the world, there are cities that are adopting principles of biophilia, a term that was coined by entomologist E.O. Wilson. It has to do with human beings having an affinity for the natural world, for nature, biophilia. And each one of these cities is daylighting rivers or they're transforming industrial areas or they're turning an old railroad trestle into a you know, couple of mile long fabulous garden area that is skyrocketing property values. We will be on this list maybe in five years because of the kind of resources that we have here in St. Louis to mobilize our own biophilia into planning and design and development and public dialogue. We will be there. Food, again, local food. What can we get locally? How can we support the growers locally? I did an interview last night on my radio show, Earthworms, on KDHX with a guy named Mark Shepard who farms up in southwestern Wisconsin, and he farms according to the discipline permaculture. And he, uh, we were talking about what kinds of species of plants you can farm with that will produce food that people will want to eat. And he said to me, do you like, um, do you like Doritos? I said, no, I like cheese balls. He said, okay, well you could produce cheese balls, snack food from chestnut flour and you could put stuff on them and maybe it wouldn't even be as chemically as your traditional cheese ball and it would taste like a cheese ball and you could go into a convenience store and get something that was a snack food that would actually nourish you because not everybody's gonna all of a sudden start eating kale 
You know, people are, even though it's become very popular. So what can our local growers grow? And this guy, this Mark Shepard, he's coming to St. Louis to do a two-day training intensive next weekend hosted by these guys, Earth Dance Farms, that are in their fifth growing season now of training farmers, not only to grow, but to sell their stuff at farmers markets and to run CSAs, which means community supported agriculture. You pay up front and then you get food every week from the farmer for the growing season. You invest, you get a return on your investment. And these folks, Earth Dance Farms, they're working in partnership with places like the St. Louis University School of Nutrition and Dietetics. How can we make this work in a structured mainstream way? This is not hippy dippy fluffy, fluffy odd stuff anymore. Down at uh, City Seeds Urban Farm, down on, it's, it's been a beautiful strip of farm off of Jefferson and Market. And it's got to move once the new exit off of Highway 40 moves. But this is a partnership between Gateway Greening, our community garden organization, and St. Patrick's Center that helps veterans resume a normal, productive, healthy life, that helps people with drug addictions and behavioral problems be able to develop job skills and get jobs farming urban farming that is a green jobs opportunity and we haven't really tapped into that as much as we need to to make it really viable um, mini grants from organizations like Slow Foods, engaging restaurants in using food that is used that is grown by local producers, engaging school districts in doing this, and getting over some of the hurdles like the insurance coverage that the farmers have to have in order to get the food into the schools. And let's see, the growing season is in the summer and kids come back to school in the fall and then they're in school from September until the following May and that's not always the growing season in St. Louis. So how do we preserve that food and keep it in schools and how do we make stuff that kids will like? People are working on these issues and working together to solve those things. Getting local food into um, the wholesale marketplace, taking it out to places where people are getting on and off the Metrolink. That is the farm to family mobile market. Last year it stopped at the Del Mar and the Hanley and up by Umsel, whatever that Metrolink stop is. And it had fresh locally grown produce that people could pick up on their way home from the train. Getting it out to where people need it. In the business world, making this work, evaluating people, planet, and profit, human, natural, and capital resources, and not just Profit and loss, yes, no, good, bad, done, not done. <laughs> St. Louis Green Business Challenge. This is a program of our Regional Chamber of Commerce, St. Louis Regional Chamber of Commerce. 135 businesses since 2010, total that's number of businesses, have engaged in a strategic process using a scorecard to green up the day-to-day -day practices that are common to everybody. Waste management, purchasing, you have food service in your building? How are you dealing with your building energy? Anybody taking alternative transportation to work? Is there a bus stop near you? Might you have bike racks or showers? Can people cycle into work? All kinds of things like that. Educating employees in the workplace about green. 107,000 employees have been affected by these companies' engagement in this program. And you'll see if you could read it, there are teeny tiny little words up there. There's some companies up there that you might think, oh my God, they're claiming to do things environmental, but we're not talking about what they do for their business. We're talking about how they do their business. And there is transformation happening also in what they do for their business in some of those companies because what's driving it is people. Individuals with curiosity and conscience and teamwork and problem solving. And that is a change agent. We are a change agent. Putting it in a mainstream place, getting it out of the Earth Day Festival and into Bush Stadium, into the major leagues. It's America's second favorite pastime. Gardening is the first. And this kind of mainstreaming of practices like recycling and composting and solar energy, that is showing up all over our community. Thanks to guys like Joe Abernathy, who's the Cardinals stadium manager, and who also happens to be the president of Stadium Managers Association nationally. And his greeting experience at Bush Stadium with the Redbirds is influencing all of professional sports, amateur sports, collegiate sports, and youth sports 
through the Stadium Managers Association nationally, coming from St. Louis. The Redbirds lead the league in green. And the Rams are doing it now, too. And I don't know what the problem is with the Blues, but they're having problems with a lot of different things. Maybe they need to change their name to the St. Louis Greens. I don't know. <laughs> big businesses, big buildings. This is the Metropolitan Square building. It is the largest one in the St. Louis area. It is an Energy Star certified building. That means they track all their energy use. They benchmark, they evaluate. How can they make it more energy efficient? And they engage their tenants in those processes. This is a chemical distribution warehouse, right? Not necessarily the greenest bulb in the array, but they just happen to have one of the largest photovoltaic solar power generating arrays in the state of Missouri on their roof. And before they put the solar panels up there, they made everything in the warehouse really energy efficient. They changed out the lighting. They changed the ventilation. They added in big ass fans. Have you seen the commercials for those big ass fans? But they did another money saving thing. They went to the manufacturer instead of the name brand. And so they even saved money on their big ass fans. And they're able to power the entire operation on solar and sell electricity back to Ameren. Construction companies, design firms, they've been greening for a long time actually since the 1990s because of the influence of the U.S. Green Building Council and their LEED rating system. So the, the building industry companies are really able to set up a level of literacy, a level of understanding that other companies can plug into. And you know that hundredth monkey theory when there's so many individuals that get something and all of a sudden the whole group gets something? That's happening with the greening of our business sector. This is another company in the, in the uh, building industry downtown. They went one step further on the we cars. You know those cars where you can um, um, you can check one out downtown or you can check one out in Clayton. They got a couple of wee cars for their company and so they just keep them in their garage. And people can take the bus, they can take Metrolink downtown, they can ride their bikes and if they need a car to a go to a meeting, they use the company car. Uh, another design firm, HOK, they went a little far in my opinion. They took away everybody's trash cans. That would be the kind of thing that would annoy me. I mean, there's almost nothing in my trash can, but oh, for crying out loud, let's not get extreme about this. And they replaced the big trash cans, ultimately, with itty bitty weedy little trash cans, but they had great big recycling bins. What if, instead of having to walk 40 feet to the recycling bin, you had the recycling bin that maybe 80% of your personal trash could go in at your desk, and you had to walk 40 feet to the trash? What if you switched it? What if we made those switches really work and be practical? Small organizations, nonprofits, partnering with larger organizations, making an impression by having bicycle ambassadors cruising around downtown for our visitors. And don't you think those guys look nice in their spandex? People come in for a conference from St. Louis and they see our ambassadors on bicycles and even police officers on bicycles. Our utilities, are part of this and you know all all human beings are on a learning curve all of us are on a learning curve there's always more that we can do there are technologies that are being promoted and tested that I might not agree with or you might not agree with but we need to have the conversations we need to have the dialogues we need to work at systemic change to ever be more sustainable and engaging companies like this in that is part of that process Niche uh, markets like the printing industry has its own certification program. They use a lot of paper, they produce a lot of waste, they've eliminated the hazards out of their inks and their solvents. They are looking at ways to really eliminate waste stream and use recycled materials and educate their customers and pass along that advantage to their customers. This is a company that produces tchotchkes, you know, like water bottles and those little foam koozies that you put around your beer cans. How many of those do we really need? I mean, I, I personally can't remember the last time I put my beer can in a koozie, and yet I have three or four of them in my office, although you still like to get them when you go to a, you know, you get a freebie. This company is doing more business in the U.S. They are using less plastics. They are reducing their shipping and their packaging materials, and they've made their facility extraordinarily energy efficient. Major corporations, 
changing their manufacturing processes, working with entities like the Department of Defense to standardize these kinds of greener processes. Um, Graybar Electric, they are using what they've done in St. Louis to green their local practices nationally across their entire corporation. And I, had, I was at a green fair at Mallinckrodt yesterday, which makes medical equipment and stuff. You think Mallinckrodt only makes chemicals, but they do a lot of medical equipment manufacturing. And they're looking at having the greening process that they're doing in their St. Louis facilities go across all of their worldwide facilities now too. And I want to pause for a minute here and say, what's driving all this? Because this is not just about a laundry list of companies doing nice green things. When I work with a new company, I always ask them, what is motivating you to mess around with this green stuff? Because it takes time. It takes resources. And there are two answers that are consistent responses. What do you think they are? Two really key thematic motivators for companies to go green, as we say. Pardon? Money savings, you think it was money savings, but not necessarily, not always. If you're a tenant and you don't pay your own utility bills, your utility bills are rolled into your lease, what is it gonna matter if you change your light bulbs? That's not gonna come back to you in savings, so money savings may not be it. Another guess. Sometimes we try to work that out. Image, you'd think, but what do you think about Monsanto? What do you think about Ameren? What do you think about Doe Run? You know, what do you think about Boeing? Image, not necessarily the biggest motivator. Pardon? Tax breaks, tax breaks woo, we'd like to think that with those kinds of incentives. And there are some incentives, there are some tax breaks, and sometimes the large print giveth and the fine print taketh away. We established our statewide a renewable energy standard, and the investor-owned utilities are supposed to kick in rebates for that, right? The solar rebates. But guess what? They set a limit of how much money they could pay out, and when they got to that limit, I'm sorry, we can't pay more than $91.9 million. That's all we've got. And so the solar rebates go away. Sometimes, yeah, not always. Okay, so here's the answer. Two things, two key drivers. One is customer expectations. And that's not always the public as a customer. It's who's your supply chain? Who are you selling things to? Maybe it's the US government and you're Boeing and you're making aircraft and the US government has standards that you have to meet. Customer expectations and the big one for the folks in the back there from Flow Valley, young talent expects that they will work for a business that has a sustainability policy that's functional and has teeth and is not just greenwashing. So you, the millennials, the generation that were in grade school when I was t giving you know, recycling leadership trainings in elementary schools 25 years ago, you're out in the workforce now and you are driving change in business with your knowledge, your literacy, your values, your practice, your expectations. My generation did not bring that into the workforce, but yours has. And that is a powerful motivator. And Beyond that, we all have to get a little kid and go outside and mess around with a little kid. You all are in Flow Valley, you need to do this as a class project. Renee Dooley, you should give them extra credit for this. Up at City College in Chicago, you should have, you should have a program, a mentoring program, where a student has a relationship with a little kid and maybe they're reading, but mainly what they're doing is they're messing around outside. Because in this era of all the little digital devices and fear of strangers and all that kind of stuff, we are raising generations of children with nature deficit disorder that will not care about any of this green stuff when they get to be your age because they don't have a relationship with nature. That is a critical need that we have to address is get little kids to keep having a relationship with nature now and on and on until they get to be big enough kids that then they'll take another little kid out. Okay, more companies, blah, 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 I'm gonna skip ahead, except I'll pause at the zoo. And the other cultural institutions in St. Louis, we work together, we help each other problem solve these kinds of things. There is a professional network of green champions that has evolved from the St. Louis Green Business Challenge that cuts across every level of professional specialty and every level of seniority from C-suite 
to hourly and contractors and interns. So like IFMA and BOMA and AIA and ASLA and the national, the uh, what is it for teachers and educators and the American Medical Association, those professional associations, we have that network for sustainability champions in St. Louis and they're talking to each other and helping each other out. Sharing examples, sharing problem solving, sharing all kinds of templates and it's happening here. And part of my job, part of my team's job, part of the relationship between folks like the Garden and the Zoo and the Academy of Science is to tell that story. It's not necessarily showing up in the Post-Dispatch, it's not necessarily showing up in the news, but it's happening. So we need more green troubadours who are out there telling this story and saying this is stuff to be proud of, this is stuff to plug into, this is job security, this is skill set development that we need, this is sustainability in action. Citizenship, big part of it too very much a part of it. This is a product that is at the end of its useful life. This is a material at the end of its useful life. It will never be recycled. Thank heaven for small favors. So why would we ever use a tree that produces oxygen, it captures rainwater, it stabilizes soil, it provides habitat, blah, 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 to make a product that can only be used once. Instead of having all of our janitorial paper products be made with 100% post-consumer recycled fiber, made from paper that has been paper as many times as it can be, and now it can only be this kind of paper one more time, and then MSD gets it. There's two reasons why all toilet paper is not made from 100% recycled fiber. What do you think they are? Pardon? Color? <laughs> I have never bought pink toilet paper. Uh, no, that's a good guess, but that's not why. The paper industry is part of it. The paper industry has not totally retooled yet to be able to make paper from paper instead of paper from trees. And in the same way that the auto industry did not retool to make more fuel efficient vehicles until we the taxpayers bailed them out, until they absolutely had to, that's not happening with the paper industry yet, even though demand for post-consumer recycled products is really going up. So that is one thing. Their industry capacity has not been modified yet to make all toilet paper from paper instead of from trees. But the other thing is taxpayer subsidies. The forest products industry is the second most highly subsidized extractive industry in the U.S. of A. right behind petroleum. So our tax dollars, everything that you just sent off, if you s paid off yesterday or everything you've been paying off last, the last year and maybe you got a refund, we are paying to keep artificially cheaper toilet paper that is made from trees instead of from paper. And once we know stuff like that, we're not, you know, we're not cruel. We're not ignorant as a species, we're responsible, we take action, we speak up, we ask for such and such, we ask for it of each other, we can ask for it of the powers that be as well. So environmental citizenship is a very, very, very critical factor, especially for young people, once again, I don't mean to belabor this point out there, Flow Valley students, but you are a demographic that political leaders are listening to probably more than my demographic, the baby boomers. We're a little bit more predictable than you are. So get involved, vote, be a participating citizen on the planet Earth. I host two environmental talk shows. Earthworms on KDHX celebrates 25 years of community service this month. It's so fun. Radio is a really elegant medium. You can show up in your jammies, you know, you can like sit there and scratch yourself and nobody knows. You still sound good. I love it. It 
It has gotten some nice recognition lately, yes. And two years ago, two springs ago, I started doing a show on the big 550 KTRS, which is called Growing Green St. Louis and focuses specifically on stuff in St. Louis and specifically telling some of these success stories and the thinking and the functions behind them to a mainstream audience. Louise mentioned the Green Resources Answer Service at the Missouri Botanical Garden. We've had our plant doctor service and our horticulture answer service for decades. We now have the planet doctor too. So if you ever have any questions about what's green about this, where do I get it? How do I responsibly get rid of it? Is there a safer alternative? Is that really true or is it greenwashing? Like whitewash, hogwash, brainwash, unsubstantiated green claims. We will either answer that question for you or we'll look it up if we don't know the answer and that adds to our knowledge base at no charge. Thank you, Missouri Botanical Garden. And thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> questions, do I get to answer questions now? Does anyone, it's your chance to stump the green geek. Yes. <laughs> Am I involved with anything that's going on with the Westlake landfill? Um, not directly. I cannot take any credit for that, but I have done a number of radio interviews about that, and I get their email newsletters from various sources, from the Westlake Citizens Group and from the um, Missouri Coalition for the Environment. Um, I have been following that very closely, yes. That is a very, very serious situation. And the Westlake Citizens Group and the Bridgeton Landfill Citizens Group and Upriver uh, in Labadee, Missouri, the Labadee environmental organization that's trying to keep a coal ash landfill out of the floodway of the Mississippi, Missouri River. Not no landfill, but no landfill and the floodway. Those are examples of citizen action that are some of the best I've ever seen. And much more is needed. And there are some really amazing partnerships there. There are moms that have formed a Facebook group about that because their kids have been getting lymphoma and their best friends are dying. There are people that grew up playing in Coldwater Creek because their dads worked at Boeing and they lived up in those communities and it was a great place to grow up and now they're finding these really terrible diseases. And putting the pits together, putting the information together and reporting that so it becomes information that can be dealt with. If the information is not present, if it's not documented if it's not presented and dogged to the authorities not much is going to happen with it yes Okay, so that Democrats, Republicans, right, left, it's a smokescreen, it's a paralyzer, it's a, it's a stopper of action, and it's a stopper of citizen action. And an organization like 350.org, seven students and one professor, did an end around around that to raise awareness about climate change. Frankly, I am not holding my breath for the federal government to take the lead on dealing with climate change because if I did, I would turn blue and die, and I'm not quite ready for that yet. But local governments and, for example, the business sector, that whole green business challenge stuff that I was showing you examples of, we are one of 50, maybe 75 such green business engagement programs in cities around the country, and some of them are little tiny little cities, and some of them are major cities like Chicago and Boston and St. Louis and New York. If government doesn't call for those things, could business call for things like, you know, a carbon emission cap, like, uh, you know, any kind of carbon tax, cap and trade, those may or may not be the most effective things. Carbon emission reduction targets, it, ha it could happen. It could come from that sector if not from government, and it could come from that sector in partnership with local government that then can speak further up the line. It's, it, you, you can't, we can't wait around for it to come from the top down. We got to make this green stuff happen and functional and have it in our literacy, our practice, and our values everywhere we can to make it work. And then vote your green conscience as well. And don't be fooled by the political rhetoric. 
If I were really smart, I would have answered that question like a politician, which would have been not to address it at all. Yes, any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, okay, that, that brings up another really good question. Once this material, once this insulation material, and you gotta like think generations ahead. So you're remodeling your house now, you're super insulating your house, and then you leave your house to your kids and they're gonna have to insulate their house again 10 years, 15, 20 years, maybe 30 years. What's gonna happen to this material? Is it gonna be recyclable down the line? That's thinking in what's called cradle to cradle instead of just cradle to grave. When you think ahead as a manufacturer, as a product chooser, and with the Green Resources Answer Service, I get a lot of questions like, I wanna put the greenest thing on my roof, I think I wanna use recycled plastic shingles, or what else should I use? And I don't always have the right answer. We don't always have the right answer for that person, but helping you ask the questions to make the best choice you can at the time. There are textile recycling, plenty of textile recycling companies around the country. We have a really good one here in St. Louis. It's called Remains. And they are what's uh, called a consolidator. They'll take the stuff from thrift stores and church um, you know, charity closets and stuff like that that can't be sold and they'll consolidate it and they figure out what else can be done with it. And a lot of times those textiles become shredded up and they get used in insulating material or they become wiping materials or packing materials or stuff like that. Down the line, can that material be recycled again? Is that something that should be manufactured in the first place? Very high end, unfortunately it's still pretty high end, green office furniture manufacturers, for example, are subscribing to the cradle to cradle philosophy. The entire spectrum of materials that are used in that process have to be able to be recycled or reprocessed again at the end of the useful life of that office chair. That thinking is still very much in its embryonic stage. It hasn't even really reached its infancy in our society, but it's the seeds are there. Did that answer your question or was I being a politician? I made my husband swear a blood oath when we got married that he would never let me run for office. That would be a really waste of a lot of good stories in my flaming youth. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, and, and Goodwill can't sell them. And the things that you give, if you get them in the door at Goodwill, they're going to send them to a textile recycler like Remains. Now, there's good news and there's bad news about stuff. A lot of the clothing that can't be sold in this country at Goodwill gets sent to places like Africa and the Caribbean, and then people there are wearing cheaply made American clothes that are putting indigenous clothing manufacturers and indigenous culture elements in clothing out of business, out of functionality. So the step back a couple, do we need to have all those things that are that cheaply made? Or does it make sense to get some things that are made really well? Do we need to demand from our consumer culture stuff that can be repaired, reused, etc.? We used to repair furniture. My father-in-law had a TV repair business. He'd go around with his little tube caddy and fix people's TVs. And now you see TVs out on the curb, you know, every Tuesday. Because we are not expecting, we're not demanding. That's where consumer demand can really be a driver. Things that are durable, things that are made to last, things that can be repaired, things that can be reused, and reclaiming some of those skills of rebuilding furniture or remaking clothing or whatever. It's not a quick fix, but it's part of the thinking process. And then, you know, where do you get your stuff? I frankly am a really dedicated shopper of the scholar shop. I call it the squalor shop, but I have to try not to say that when I'm talking to their employees. It's, I can't handle anymore going into a store where everything's all the same. It makes my head spin. But when I go into a resale store, it satisfies my hunter-gatherer instinct. You know, I can like look at the colors and the textures and stuff, and if I get something, I'm paying $15 instead of 75 so that is a level in our society today of 
beneficial reuse, I think, but still, there's all that stuff out there. Do we really need all that more, 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 more? Why is that a measure of health in our economy? Why? Uh, we send people out there to tell the bus drivers to turn it off, please. We give bus drivers for tour groups a pass to come into the garden and be a part of the tour. Uh, we, have, we do have no idling stuff posted. We were, I'm very proud to say, we were the first public facility in St. Louis that had electric vehicle charging stations available. Thank you, thank you. For the general public, and they're free. You gotta put in your credit card to activate the thing, but it doesn't put any charge on your on your thing. And a little side note about that, when we put them in, we have four EV charging spaces. And when we first put them in, the inner two were signed just for electric vehicles. And the outer two were signed for EVs or hybrids. And last year, we got to a point where we started to have visitors come in and complain because there was a hybrid parked in the EV parking space. So we changed the signs. And now if you're an EV, you can park there. And if not, forget it. And one of our staff members on visitor services, when we had our lantern festival two summers ago, and it was like, this massive throng of influx, and we all had a park two blocks away if we were going to work at the time when Lantern Festival happened. She bought a Chevy Volt just so she could get preferred parking. So we're working on it, and the airport is working on it. The airport put in a, it's called the cell phone lot. So if you're there to pick up somebody and you're waiting for their flight to come in, you can go park in the cell phone lot at no charge, not the little charge for the short-term parking, until your person you're picking up calls you on the cell phone and then you zip in and you pick them up at departing flights or arriving flights. And they're integrating compressed natural gas vehicles and biodiesel vehicles. They've been working on their fleets for a long time. There are so many of these little pockets of stories around our community stitching them together to be not only a, a suit, but a style, a green style that St. Louis really puts forth. That's, that's some of the stuff we're working on. And, you know, we give our employees um, pre-tax transit benefits. If you want to use transit, that's something that a lot of companies are doing and that uh, Metro cooperates with ride finders on. So if you're going to use transit all the time, it's like you're putting money in your health savings account. You can get your transit pass before you have to pay taxes on that income. Those little benefits, we need a lot more of those little kind of little benefits, putting them together and making use of them. Any other questions? Louise? Um, actually, my perspective is really only from hearsay. I, I have not done a lot of business travel for several years. You, you know, you do a lot more in international travel than I do. But in terms of like the National Business Greening Network, looking at the directory of those programs that were um, um, published last year, gosh, we're, we're doing great. And we don't have any of the economic drivers that they have, for example, in California and New York where their utility rates are so high that you know, it really pays back to make your building more energy efficient, even for tenants. Or the landfill tipping fees are so high that you're, you, you know, you're practically making money when you're recycling as opposed to having to pay to throw stuff away. I, I think that the big thing that I can say about St. Louis with absolute confidence is that we have so many resources of organizations, municipalities, partnerships, nonprofits, businesses, engaged individuals, volunteer organizations like the Master Naturalists and docents at places like the zoo and the garden, and the Eastern Missouri beekeepers, and all the folks who have community gardens through gateway greening that are all over the whole city, building community, building neighborhoods through gardening. Those kinds of efforts are really cutting across all economic and class and cultural lines. And even though green has typically been sort of a, you know, frankly, a white middle class thing to do, when you are doing an anti-littering program 
in a community where there might be a lot of crime because there's a lot of poverty and there's not a lot of you know drivers for kids to stay in school anti-littering practices help stabilize a neighborhood trees help stabilize a neighborhood and there's data that shows that kind of stuff so getting researchers to provide more of those that data and getting that information out there more to policymakers so that the data can really do the job that data does which is sell the wonks that make their decisions on the basis of data I think we have an incredible wealth of that kind of stuff and we have also a, a growing wealth of people who are telling that story and who are communicating about it because it's really only been since maybe 2006 that green has even been mainstream in our community and our society. And that's 2006, 2014, eight years, that is a blink of an eye in cultural change time. So, what, you know, the, the sustainability, the multidisciplinary sustainability class here tonight from Florissant Valley, you're a really good example of, you, you may be getting degrees in communications or education or IT or mechanics, and here you are studying sustainability. And in the same way that you need to be able to do basic math and speak well and write well and, you know, show up on time to work, these are life skills. And kids are getting these skills through a lot of different kinds of programs at the grade school level, at the high school level. Green is really, it's like grass coming up through concrete. It's, it's infiltrating, and it's infiltrating very slowly relative to the needs and the demands of stuff like climate change, which frankly does keep me up nights sometimes, and yet it's happening. Uh-huh, uh-huh, Larry Lazar and Connie McAfee, uh-huh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had Brian on my radio show last night. I had Brian Etling on my radio show last night, one of the climate leaders. And there are folks in the Green Business Challenge, um, one of them is the green guy at Graybar Electric that went to the climate leaders training in Chicago last year and, you know, did that on his own time, did that on his own nickel. The Climate Reality Project, what an interesting title for that. The Citizen Climate Lobby, the Climate Leaders Network, those are citizen efforts, citizen engagement. That is not waiting around for elected leaders to do the job. It's empowering citizens with information and communication tools and a network to be able to say to those leaders, I mean, you know, maybe we still don't have the jump on lobbyists that are so well funded for various kinds of special interests, but you can go and talk to your elected leader and, and educate them and make a difference. And then, of course, you can try to vote them out if you think that they're a butthead. <laughs> so that's, it's, compared to what was happening 25 years ago in this community and in our country, when I started talking about this green stuff, it's a sea change. Now also, I mean, there's, there's a sea change of intelligence and response, but then there's also the whole tsunami of stuff like the six mass extinction and climate change and all that other duda. So we are doing the best we can. What else can we do? But we have been so ignorant of these green principles and so not really empowered and not really coached and mentored and networked to be able to make this stuff work in the same way that we are making work other relational skills. How many of you in this audience still feel that a particular gender or a particular race is inferior to another? Those were cultural norms not that long ago. And in some people's minds, unfortunately, they probably still are. But that is not the standard cultural norm anymore. So we're changing that cultural norm. And that is a big honking thing. That's like, you know, we're moving, moving the big thing along in terms of human consciousness. And sometimes it's like, other times it's like, You do it every way you can. 
I think I'm just about out of time, but I'll take one more question if there is another question. Thank you for these questions. This is like such a treat for me to get to take questions. We're doing it, and we need to keep doing it because green goes with everything. It's like tolerance, it's like safety, it's like wellness. Those are three really good examples of green as a society, it's part of our toolbox as human beings. Safety. It was not all that long ago, it was before they built the arch, but it was like, you know, back in the time of Eads Bridge. If you built a building or a bridge or a monument or something and only a couple of guys died or lost their hand, you were doing really good. You were like, whoa, that was a great safety record. And that is not acceptable anymore. Tolerance. Think of the ways, I mean, we still have this stuff in our society. We have it racially, we have it in terms of gender, we have it in terms of relational preferences, we have it in terms of, you know, what country did you come from, what religion have you come from. Our tolerance is one of those things that human beings may have to really evolve into. But wellness is a really good example of a cultural phenomenon that is not that old. 10 or 12 years ago, if you went to your doctor and you wanted to talk about the effect on your health of like your relationships or your stress at work or the fact that you know you weren't sure you were getting enough exercise, unless your doctor was Deepak Chopra or somebody like that that you'd see on Pledge Drive on Channel 9, you'd pay your $50 and it would go right over their head and you'd be out of there with a packet of pills in your hand. And today, when you go into your health practitioner and you talk about wellness, you may be there because that's a benefit that you get out of your health insurance or from your workplace. So understanding the effect of all those relational factors on your health, on your physical health, that it isn't just the mechanical body, it's the whole organism, and being able to have the medical profession, the health-related professions deal with that in a proactive and respectful manner, that has only happened in the last 10 or 12 years. That's a very, very new thing that that has become mainstream. And I figure 2006, 2007, by you know, my societal evaluation for green to have become mainstream, that's eight years now. I think we're doing pretty good. But we got a lot more to do, and that means job security for green geeks like me. And everyone out there at Flow Valley, this is part of your toolbox. You need to learn this stuff. You need to take it out there no matter what profession you are in. This is part of your skill set. It's part of the value that you bring in to your profession and fulfilling your purpose in life. And that's true of anybody at any age, I think, if we're humans. And I'll lick anybody who tries to tell me different. <laughs> Thank you.